Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the intersection of cannabis, the capital markets, and culture. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg of KCSA Strategic Communications speak with the CEOs, financial experts, cultural icons, legislators, and generally interesting people moving the cannabis industry forward. This week, Anne is on vacation as it's her birthday. Happy birthday, Anne. So Lewis and Jeffrey Goldberger, a partner at KCSA, are speaking with Arnaud Dumas de Rally, co-founder and co-CEO of the Blink Group which distributes and supports best-in-class cannabis vaping hardware and complementary ancillary products. He's also chairman of the International ISO Committee on Vaping Standards, chairman of the European SEN Committee on Vapor Products, former president of Five Vape in the EU, and one of the world's most renowned experts in vapor technology, regulations, manufacturing, and distribution. Don't sit back, lean forward. Now on to our interview with Arnaud Dumas de Raleigh of the Blink Group. Hello, Jeffrey. Good afternoon, Lewis. How are you? I'm awesome. Welcome to the Green Rush. You know, I, I feel like a rookie here because I've never been invited to partake in this, so this is kind of exciting well, for me. Well, you are a rookie, and, and um, the Jeffrey I'm speaking to is Jeffrey Goldberger, who is one of my business partners here at KCSA. Um, Jeffrey, as you know, or actually you, you don't know, you don't know who the hell Jeffrey is, but Jeffrey straddles both public relations and investor relations and um, is somebody who is a, a relatively newer convert to the cannabis industry. So we're going to be chatting with one of our clients today, a gentleman named Arnaud de Raleigh from the Blink Group. But, you know, this is Jeffrey's first time on the podcast. So how do you feel, bud? Listen, I'm a bit nervous. You know, most of the time I get to sit behind the scenes and be the puppeteer, if you would. Now I'm the puppet. So it's going to be very interesting to see how I play. Well, I've always wanted to pull your strings, and uh, this is my chance to do so. So, you know, when we started our cannabis practice about six six years ago or so, you were a little reticent about it. What was your concern? Well, I was I was very reticent. The fact of the matter is, just like anybody else, it's reputation. I was deathly afraid of our reputation as a 50-year-old public relations firm being exposed to an industry that is nascent, not federally illegal, and and concern me what others, meaning our clients, would think of us. And the truth of the matter is I'm a convert. Um, The industry has grown. It has matured. We've helped it mature. And it has not been a concern for, you know, a couple of years now. It's been it's been great. And, you know, similar to Anne, who was not comfortable in talking about cannabis or talking about her consumption, you know, unlike me, who's like, I'm out there, baby. I, you know, everybody knows that that, you know, it is it is my general intoxicant of choice. Um, you know, you also have become more of a convert, not necessarily to the consumption side, but to the business of cannabis. Listen, the, the business of cannabis is is, you know, in baseball terms, even though Lewis is a Mets fan and I'm a Brewers fan. We're in the early innings. This has a long time to go. We're going to look at extra innings and we're going to be in the game the entire time. So I'm excited to be part of this. And I am excited to have you on with the Green Rush. So um, as I mentioned, we are going to be speaking with Arnaud de Rale from uh, the Blink Group. And Jeffrey, you work on this account. Is, before we get into having Arnaud tell us about it, is there anything that, you, you know, that you're particularly impressed with or concerned about by this company? I mean, what, why, why are we actually talking to this guy? Well, listen, the, the, the way that I came across the Blink Group is I had started to dip my toe in the water. I started going to a number of the major conferences. And I kept on running into this fascinating company called Blink. What really got me excited about them is their enthusiasm, their enthusiasm for the business and what they're doing to help multi-state operators and also the the broader community of people that are moving into vape uh, get into understanding it and also having the highest quality products available. That's what we're trying to do on the public relations side, so it resonated with me. All right, well... I look forward to, I know Arno. I've known Arno actually now for a couple of years because we talked with him before he got into the cannabis world. He was in the, uh, the e-cigarette and vaping world. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. 
So with that, on to our conversation with Arnaud de Raleigh from the Blink Group. Arnaud, man, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Blink Group? Because I know that in your current iteration, you're, you're, you're primary to involved with developing and distributing cannabis consumption hardware like vapes and, and the like. Um, but tell us how it started, what you guys are doing, where you're going, all that, that, that jazz. Oh, sure. So basically, it, it's, we, have, we have three markets that we service. Uh, the first one, and, uh, which is our, our main market, is enterprise solutions. So that's for big brands, MSOs, LPs, who want to create their own uh, proprietary vaping devices. Um, then we have, uh, so w- within that enterprise solutions market, we also do all of the different ancillary services around vaping hardware. So uh, testing SOPs, we, we write the filling and the capping SOPs, the incubation period, depending on the oil and the device. Um, all the way, all the way, basically from formulation where we can do your formulation down to merchandising where we go train the bud tenders on each of the specific products that we created for them. So for formulation, you mean you're literally saying this is the recipe to make the oil that goes in the cartridge? Yes, we do the formulation and the safety testing on the formulations. So Arno, we've talked about this a couple of times. Tell our audience why that is important. Well, one, one of the things that a, a lot of people think is, well, let's just grab a vaping device, whichever one it is, and, uh, and put our oil in it. But unfortunately, that's a recipe for disaster because a lot of these devices depend uh, on the oil or vice versa, which means if you have, if you have a product uh, that people are buying, it's the oil and the device. If you have a shitty device, and the best oil, the product is gonna be shitty. And the other way around, if you have the best device and the shittiest oil, your product still will be shitty. So both of them have to be matched. And I think that's one of the key reasons why we also uh, get involved on the formulation side so we can make formulations that actually match the hardware and desired effects. So as we learned in grade school, two wrongs do not make a right. Exactly. Very interesting. Great. So, so we, you started talking a little bit, and, and we were talking earlier, is that you're, you're playing from conception through production, merchandising and the like. Can you walk us through your model a little bit deeper? What's unique? And, and frankly, why somebody should care? Why should a customer care, meaning your enterprise customer, and why is it important for your end customer, the, the, the consumer? Well, first of all, um, with, with everything that's going on in the industry right now, the, the acquisitions, the consolidation, people are good at what they're good at. And I think this is something that, that, that we've learned throughout our experience as entrepreneurs is uh, you can't be good at everything. We have been in this space for 10 years and our, our team in China uh, are the former quality control uh, and quality assurance managers of Ikea, Lowe's, and Home Depot. Uh, So they're really, really used to understanding compliance and uh, and looking at at surveying suppliers. And also writing writing instructions that nobody can actually follow. Yeah, oh yeah, that's that's true. (laughs) Um, But the the reason we do this is to control the entire supply chain. Once again, you can be working with any provider of hardware, they're not really manufacturers. They are assemblers. What we do is have our entire list of suppliers. We go to these factories. Some of them are good at assembling um, dry herb products like convection technologies. Some others are good at cartridges. Some others are good at batteries. We just work with the one that's best suited for the job. We're not tied to one factory. Uh, and, and again, as I said about the suppliers, we bring our own list of suppliers that we have previously vetted. And I can tell you right now, being chairman of the ISO standards on vaping products, uh, I can guarantee you there's only, there's, there's only a handful of factories that are truly ISO certified uh, and that didn't buy their ISO certificate for 220 bucks in China. All right, so I have two questions. First, what is an ISO certification? 
ISO, I, an ISO certification as it pertains to our industry is mostly has to do with uh, the quality management system that people put in place. So let's say there's a faulty battery on a production line. Um, how is it logged? How, we, how do we ensure that this is not going to happen moving forward? Uh, how do we make sure that all of the, uh, all of the, uh, the SOPs uh, have been followed? How do we make sure that when we get consumer feedback that that's logged somewhere in the QMS? It's not a product is not ISO certified. It's the quality management system in place. And that's actually what we're tending to because we're in the process of being ISO 9001 uh, certified. And we think we'd be the first uh, cannabis company to, uh, to, to obtain that certification. Your production facilities are all in China and we are in a, a full on trade war. Um, what are the impact of the tariffs having on your business? And are you looking for different potential manufacturing facilities, whether they be in the U.S. or in Mexico or maybe other low cost countries? But how are you how are you how is the impact of the Trump trade tax? What is it? What what impact is the Trump trade Trump trade tax having on you? Well, it's it's having a pretty big impact because we have a uh, we, we there's it's 25 percent. It was it was ten, and uh, and it moved to twenty five percent, very simply, uh, passing all that on uh, to the end user, and uh, unfortunately, it's going to make the product a lot less accessible, especially when you see on the medical market at least how much it costs. And 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 what is that doing to some of your relationships with your customers? Meaning. It, it you know early on you might be able to pass on a majority of those those increases just because everybody else you know everybody does it, but does it come to a point where these customers say I, I can't do business with you anymore? Are are there alternatives for them to you know go elsewhere, or 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 do you end up having a standstill sometimes? Or you end up eating the margin, right? Oh, it, it, we 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 eat in our case we eat part of it. Um, simply by optimizing our supply chain. Again, we've been doing this for 10 years. So in, to give you an example, a simple phone call will unlock products from customs from, 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 our, from, from the Blink Group um, because we've been doing it for so long. So optimizing that entire supply chain is how we can uh, absorb some of it, but the rest ultimately gets passed on. This entire trade war doesn't make any sense at all for our industry. Because people think about vaping products, but it touches the entire industry. Lead lighting, any extraction machines. That- Hold on, that's LED lighting, not just lead, right? We're not we're not talking about the stuff that's going to kill you. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, LED. Um, it's it's about it's about all of that uh, in in the industry and all these products that are coming into the market. The packaging as well, everything is regulated by these tariffs. Trump's trade war doesn't make sense. The rationale behind the war is stealing American jobs and is stealing American know-how. The problem is the jobs and the know-how have always been in China. They have never been here. Um, And people ask, hey, can we bring manufacturing to the US? Well, you can, but it's, it's gonna cost you an arm simply because the pace of innovation in this industry uh, makes it that by the time you figure out how to automate an entire product product line, the product is already obsolete. So it's just evolving too fast for us to be able to manufacture here. There are some people that 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 are looking at this, and uh, we've actually looked at it at, at, at getting the raw materials sent to uh, Vietnam or or Taiwan. Um, we, Taiwan, even though being China, we we can get lower tariffs. Um, but by by offsetting by outsourcing that we would avoid a lot of the tariffs but i mean if everyone does that then the the trade war doesn't make sense and the trade war will be will be uh will be diverted to vietnam so i don't think it's a i don't think it's a long term solution i also don't think these tariffs will stay in place for too long so arno let, let's let's lighten up the discussion a little bit before we move on in our big discussion Lewis feels much better now. <laughs> you must have some, you know, maybe at the time they weren't funny, but you have some funny experiences that you and your team have had on the ground in China with your relationships with some of your manufacturing partners. 
especially since cannabis is is so illegal in China. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's just, yeah. let me start like this. I've had two friends of mine uh, that play uh, rugby with me uh, for for the Shenzhen Dragons. We we actually sponsor the uh, the Shenzhen um, rugby team. Um, so th- that was that was pretty funny getting uh, speaking to uh, Chinese officials and telling them that you want to write vape and cannabis consumption technologies on on their team's jersey. Uh, we had to take out cannabis, so that's why it only says vape consumption technologies. Uh, but that that's just to, goes to show how how deep of a relationship we have in China. The funny story is that two of my buddies on the on on the team uh, at the end of the year they get the the Chinese police has quotas on uh, on drugs and stuff like that. So at the end of the year they you mean how much they use? They have minimum consumption quotas. Oh, how many arrests they can make? I'm, I'm I was kidding. <laughs> And uh, and and they go to bars. They make everyone pee in a cup. They do a THC a, a THC test. And when you're positive, you, you spend five de- five days in jail. After that, they escort you with three cops to your apartment. You have two hours to pack as many as many things as you can, and they take you to the border to Hong Kong. I, I hope they weren't two of your better players. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, and it it really it really is scary. I mean. I, I'm I'm lucky enough. I've never been been tested, and I don't use THC uh, except in my case right now with my back issue. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's kind of freaky. And I used to bring in uh, a lot of oils, and for the past two years, when I heard that they cracked down like that, I'm like, no, I'm not taking the risk anymore. Um, we've actually developed another way to test oils over there. But yeah, funny things. <laughs> that's that's more scary than funny, but. Um... You've been an entrepreneur for a long time. You know, you've done, this is not your, your first crack at, at building a company. And, and I believe that entrepreneurship is a study in failure. You know, you fail and fail and fail until you eventually succeed. Um, you know, and, and it's always, there's these moments where it's darkest before the dawn, like, oh shit, I am going to just lose it. Can you tell us about one of those moments where you thought, I'm screwed? We are never, you know, this company is dead. And then what you took from that so that you have been able to turn Blink into the success that it is. I think it's, it, this is mostly on, 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 on previous experiences. Um, that, 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 again, as you say, you learn by failure. This is, this is my sixth company. And, uh, and each and every time, even if it was a success, there were still failures along the way that you learn from. Um, my, my biggest I think biggest failure uh, was with my first two companies trying to control everything, trying to have my say on everything. And it, you just become crazy. And delegation, I think, is something that should be done right from the start to people. Empower people that you work with. Empower your employees. Empower your partners. Um, it's, it's having having them do a lot of the a lot of the le- legwork and understand how it goes. Because you can't control everything, and if you're in a situation where you do, um, you lose it. Your brain just doesn't function. So really de- delegating and, and letting people uh, live up to their responsibilities and knowing when to say, hey, guys, you did a good job. So great. Th- thanks so much. So let- let's move forward a little bit in this discussion. Um, earlier this year, Blink announced the Cannabis Vape Safety Initiative. Can we talk about that and why it's important for the industry and why it's important for Blink to be viewed as a leader in this industry? Or not just viewed, to be actually to be a leader, because we can say we view as a leader, but to be a leader is different. Correct, correct. Exactly. Um, And we we were debating, actually, internally, should we do this through an association or should we do this uh, through Blink? Uh, I think our main objective by doing this Cannabis Vape Safety Initiative is to have the entire industry understand the importance of standards and understand uh, why they are here, why they are here to protect the consumer. And if you protect the consumer, you're essentially protecting your business. Um, And uh, I think we saw the direct impact at the beginning of the year when phase three testing came in in, in, in in California, sorry, so w- will you explain that a little bit before you move on and, and say why it was important? Well, 
phase three testing, uh, at least let's talk about just the cannabis, uh, the, the vaping part, um, included a lot of heavy metal testing. Heavy metals come from the soil, they come from the water, come from the pesticides, but they also come from the cartridge. Um, there's an alloy that, that 90, 99% of the industry in China uses, which is called H59. That's uh, an, a, a brass alloy that includes a little bit of, of lead to make it more malleable. And during the entire production process, it's easier to work with that alloy. So it's also become a commodity and become the cheapest one. The problem is when you use certain terpenes and, and, and THC itself uh, have that, that leaching property and are able to extract that heavy metal, and then when you get your product tested, you're above the limits. Now, the limits that California set are, are, are I would say, I'm going to take this to a certain extreme, but if you're walking in the street in New York, inhaling the air, you're probably inhaling more than the California limits of lead. Um, but nevertheless, it's great, it's, it's great for people to understand it. And when this happened, half of the products on the market got pulled from the shelves because no one gave a shit. And we've been saying this and talking about heavy metals for the past year and a half. No one, no one cared. Well, they think about heavy metals in terms of stressing the plant at the end of the, the flower cycle to have the plant die off and put all the energy into the flower. But you're talking something, some, something really different. Yeah, the heavy metals that come from the devices. <coughs> and that's, that's really, really uh, an issue moving forward. And keep in mind that we're in, we're in a, a situation in the industry where we don't have all of the signs on cannabis. Maybe some cannabinoids are going to be leaching other products. Maybe we're going to have to start testing for other uh, compounds. And uh, I think another one of the, 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 the biggest surprises we have is that no one is testing for emissions. You go to any of the labs, you say, hey, guys, can you test what the emissions of my product? They're like, oh, how do you do that? You mean, hold on, emissions as in I'm smoking a, a, a vape pen and it's you're talking about emissions on the secondhand smoke or what do you mean by emissions? Em emissions is the aerosol that comes out of your vape pen. It's essentially what's hitting your, bo your body first. So everyone's, uh, everyone's concentrated on testing the oil inside, but that oil changes state. And when there's a, a state change... When, it, when, it's, when it's heated, you mean it's, when it's aerosolized and heated, what you're actually inhaling, nobody has done any health testing on that at all. No one and no one <laughs> understands this. This is something we've been doing in the nicotine vaping industry for 10 years now. So so how how easy is a transfer of that knowledge base into the cannabis space? It is. There is nothing more easy. The issue here, and I think this is the issue with any kind of regulation, is right now no one's asking for it. If we start putting our finger on it, then the regulator is going to be interested and take it to a whole new level. If we start doing it ourselves without publicizing it, but just knowing what's in there, first of all, we'll make the products better. And second, we'll be ready when this, this type of regulation comes into play, because I know it is going to come into play. It's the exact same reproduction of what happened to the nicotine vaping industry. There's no new product allowed on the market since August 8, 2016. I don't want this to happening to the cannabis industry. That is one of the reasons why we launched this Cannabis Vape Safety Initiative, so people understand what needs to be done, and, and there's a, a minimal level of self-regulation that we can do to be ready once federal kicks in. Well, given that cannabis is still a federally, you know, a Schedule One drug at the federal level, they're not going to look at this at all, right? The FDA isn't going to put out, put out guidelines. Does that mean that you're going state by state? You're going into Sacramento, you're going to Albany, you know, you're going to each of the state capitals and targeting the, their cannabis control boards to explain this to them? Or how are you getting this message out? I'm explaining it to the industry. This is we have memos that we that we give to all of our clients and say, hey, this is what we're providing. This is this is why we provide it. Uh, I'll give you an example on a spec sheet for a, for a product. Our spec sheets are 60 pages long because we have the test results of every single component in that device and not just the features of the device. Um, and we're trying to educate as this goes. This is not something that we can just clip, flip on a switch and say, this is how it's going to happen. 
we also don't want to be in a position where we're setting us up for overregulation, but we want to be ready when it when it happens. You know, consumers don't know about this and and the the bajillions of people who listen to this podcast every day are now going to be asking themselves, well, shit, how do I know if the cartridges I'm buying are safe or not? Are you guys working with your partners to label in any way to say, you know, this is. Uh, uh, you know, it's a good housekeeping yeah, seal yeah, of have approval, you, have, right? Yeah. Have you brought that forward to your customers to to differ because it would be a great differentiator in the marketplace? Exactly. That's what we do with our clients. There, we we can provide full traceability on every and every single one of the products. Um, we we've just set up an entire batching system now on all the devices, and each device has a serial number and a batch number. So in case there's an issue. Uh, in six months with one device, we know exactly where they are and where they went. So, so, so but what, is, what does that mean ultimately, though? Because if there was a major issue, a, a broad issue that like affected a recall. A, a recall, who has the exposure? Do you share the exposure with your, your partners? You know, where does the buck stop? Oh, on, 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 on all the regulations and the products that are being tested right now, like heavy metals, we guarantee it. We'll we'll bear the entire burden if there if 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 there's an issue. So so let's t- so let's say it became a very big issue for one of your larger customers, and, and as you said, you bear the entire brunt of this. We're talking about a federally illegal industry. Are, are you self-insuring? Do you, can you find an insurance company out there that's going to back you on this as you grow and become a major player? And if not, I can recommend one. <laughs> uh, I'd be interested in looking because we have to renew our uh, our insurance right now. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll take you up on the recommendation. Um, we have no, we have we have uh, general product liability right now uh, that that handles part of the recalls, uh, but the rest is mostly a recall that we would be doing uh, because we have our own product identifier numbers for each product for each client. Uh, so it's very easy for us to identify which ones uh, have issues and uh, recall them uh, with, with that client. We spent the last couple of minutes talking about the hardware and, and the potentials of heavy metal there. But when you're vaping something, you're not only vaping pure cannabis oil. It is mixed with other substrates. Does that matter? Does it matter if it's MCT or coconut oil or, or, or should people just care about the, the cartridge itself? No, of course it matters. Everything you put inside matters. Um, what what I usually tell people is is try heating up PG, so propylene glycol, VG, vegetable glycerin, and MCT, coconut oil. Uh, heat them up at, at at 200 degrees and measure the shit that comes out. You're going to be surprised that uh, aside maybe from the formaldehyde that is a little bit higher uh, in PG, PG is has a lot less compounds that come out in toxic compounds that come out than MCT and VG. It's kind, kind of counterintuitive because VG is vegetable glycerin and PG is man-made. But it's the same thing with, are you using uh, artificial flavors or natural flavors? Natural flavors are great, but they're not consistent. And natural flavors can change from, from, from one area of a crop to another. Uh, artificial flavors, uh, this was a big deal in nicotine vaping a couple of years ago. Artificial flavors, we control what we, what we put inside. So I'll give you an example of uh, vanillin, the vanilla uh, flavor. That has one molecule in there that is very, very allergen. When we make the vanilla flavor, we can take that molecule out and not have any bad emissions linked to that molecule. So it's it's always the balance between made by nature and made by man uh, that, that, that that needs to be sure. So when you're talking about the solvents, in the oil, yes, it's important to understand what's in there and what you're going to be inhaling. Keep in mind that these are lipids. Your lung alveolas. It's like putting. It's like uh, to a certain uh, to a certain extent, pouring olive oil in your lungs and hoping that everything will go through. You know, all of these all these vapes are labeled with what the substrate is. If you were if you were taking your son for the first time to a dispensary, what would you tell him to look for? 
you know, and say, okay, this is safe, this is not safe, this is safe, this is not safe. Like, if you could do a checklist, like, what are the two or three things to look for from a safety perspective? Um, that, I think, would be the, the, the key thing that a lot of our audience would be interested in. I, th- I think I would look for traceability and uh, being able to, uh, to, to see the, the, the COAs of the product. And, uh, and Hold on, what, what, what's a COA? A certificate of analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, secondly, I think I'd look at something that is uh, pure extract, maybe with five to ten percent terpenes inside, uh, that doesn't use MCT, which is the majority of the, the of the products out there today. Great. So, why don't we do a quick? Let's do a quick pivot on the discussion. You're you're a relatively new player in the nascent industry. Uh, the capital markets have been heated. Uh, money's coming in. Money's being asked for. Tell us what you've done from historically from a capital raising perspective and where you are in your capital uh, life cycle. So we've, we've raised uh, uh, a friend and family round last year. Uh, and uh, we actually are in the middle, um, have just finalized all the documentation, and in the middle of, uh, of the roadshow for uh, our Series A. We're looking for uh, for about five million dollars. Um, mostly, that will go into um, infrastructure. So, having more people uh, in our China office, having more people here, and uh, and and more people that are able to take care of the customers. Because again, if you look at the enterprise solutions model, uh, we have one single point of contact who is a project manager. Um, and who manages everything from packaging to SOPs to uh, the product themselves, the formulation. And, uh, and we're, we're with the client every step of the way, basically. So, so, so tell us from your perspective, how have the capital markets been and what has their receptivity been to you? We hear about money just flowing in, but it, it isn't that easy. Give us an update of what's going on with you. It's not, it's not easy. I think our, the, the model that we provide, since we're the only ones in the industry right now able to uh, actually controlling the entire supply chain on, on the ancillary vaping space, um, it, 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 it buys peace of mind. I think both investors and clients are happy to be paying a little, a little premium than, than, than if they went directly with China, but to have an American company to deal with uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and and have the assurance that in case of any regulatory problem, complete traceability and transparency is possible with us. Last year, we saw billions of dollars of market cap go public, right on the on the CSE. This year, it's been a little slower, um, but we're still seeing a tremendous you know, amount of companies that are listing going through RTO process because they know that they need access to both the capital that, that an, uh, a listing brings and then also the liquidity and the, the currency that a public, a public equity brings. Have you guys been thinking about an RTO? Is there any timeline on that? Should I not ask that question? <laughs> no, no, we, we have. You know, it's actually funny because last summer when we were doing our fe- friends and family round, we were contacted by by three three different companies that wanted us to do an RTO, but we were doing two hundred thousand dollars in revenue a month, and it just doesn't make sense. I mean, I I understand the appetite for it, uh, but I also think we're we're in a bubble and uh, we're nearing the end of a bubble, so I'm not sure that that is really the way to go. Uh, on on our end, um, I would say if we're looking at a 18 to 24 month horizon, we'd be more looking at the NASDAQ than the, than the CSE, um, just like uh, our friends at GreenLane. And, uh, and, and are, are, they, are they really your friends? Can we, can we be honest? They, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm kidding. I was kidding. I was 100%. kidding. 100%. I'm not, I'm not trying to stir up any shit between you and GreenLane. Maybe a little, you know. Not at all. Adam, Adam Schoenfeld is a very good friend of ours. Um, and, uh, and uh, there's there's no right now we're in this nascent industry. This is my third nascent industry after after, for instance, nicotine vaping. We're in a situation where we we can all work together. There's there's a there's a there's a piece of the cake for everyone. And keep in mind that the legal market is only is is only at maximum twenty five percent of the entire market. 
So the pie is the pie is going to grow. So, so our, no, tell us a little bit. You know, we've had MSOs, we've had cultivators, plant touching companies uh, be on our show, and we've worked with a lot of them and the challenges they have from a banking perspective, et cetera. But, but you're in a different position. You're, you're not a plant touching company, although you're, 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 you're what, a, a, a half pregnant sister of that. You're so close. I mean, are there any challenges of the, the current regulatory environment that are affecting you? We've had we've had we've had challenges. For instance, getting loans. As soon as they see they see vaping, they're like, "Oh, well, we're going to jack up the the premiums. We're going to jack up the the the, the percentages." Um, we've seen some challenges in, on that end, but on a banking end, I mean, we we bank at TD Bank. Um, have had no issues. So do we. Yeah, it's 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 very it's very simple actually, and the the fun part uh, about TD Bank is TD Bank is a Canadian bank, um, and uh, when when we work with clients in Canada, even though their account is a TD Bank, they still have to go through a funds transfer system, and it's it's painful to get paid from Canadian companies. <laughs> we've we've spent most of our time talking about the U.S. and China, um, but you guys, you personally, and you guys have exposure in Europe, and Europe is is the fastest growing kind of nascent market out there. What are you seeing there in terms of acceptance of vaping um, versus flour? Because most of Europe is a flour first, you know, place. How are they getting into the vaping, you know, the vaping culture? Well, your, Europe in terms of nicotine vaping is far ahead than the U.S. is way, way ahead than way more ahead than the U.S. is. So I think the, the, the entire vaping aspect and the harm reduction of vaping versus smoking is embedded now in, in the European market. So vaping will become a lot more prevalent and it's an easy way for people to be in contact with the product. I mean, look at the sales of, of, of concentrates um, in, over the past few months. Even here, when you, get, when you get the data, you can see that the sales of concentrates are keep on rising we're almost in certain states at at, at 50 percent uh, flour, 50 percent concentrates. I'm I'm putting the, the edibles and topicals aside. Um, I think that well, but but edibles edibles and topicals are another form of a concentrate. I mean, you're still extracting the oil from from whether it be the flour or trim and infusing it into a, a gummy or a piece of chocolate or you know a sports cream. Oh no, of course, of course, I completely agree with you, uh, but. I like that. I, I hate it when people just straight up disagree. So it's nice to have people who agree. Doesn't happen very often. It does not happen very often. I live my life in a place of wrong. He's right. <laughs> you know, sometimes sometimes you don't realize it, but you realize it like two or three weeks later that you were wrong. And um, it happens every day as long as you realize it and learn from it. That's the yeah. most important. It's true. But uh, but Europe is uh, I think is going to is when when regulation uh, happens over there, um, mostly I think everyone's looking right now at Denmark. I was at uh, at uh, the MJ Biz Symposium over there, um, got a chance to meet the, the, the health minister of uh, of Denmark and uh, speaking a little bit about the standards. And she told me that all the other European states are making inquiries to see if they can have if they can have Denmark's framework for legalizing medical cannabis. So, I mean, even France, my, my home country, is, uh, is going through a pilot program right now for medical cannabis. This is, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to reach um, masses probably in the next two, two years in Europe. And I think all of the companies over on our end, uh, whether Canadian or American, uh, really have to take advantage of that. I mean, you see a lot of other companies now from South America that are really uh, betting on Europe because they want to export everything over there. Well, Ger Germany has the fastest growing cannabis market in the world. Um, their health system actually allows you to use, can you know, pay for it medicinally. Uh, you know, a lot of our clients are either Canadian LPs and you were talking about con companies that are working in, you know, places like Colombia, which is a deal for growing outdoor for export. Are you working with 
you know, Canadian LPs or, or other international providers to design new form factors for the European market specifically? Yes, we are. We actually, we actually have quite a few customers right now in Europe, um, mostly on the traditional uh, 510 thread battery and cartridge. Uh, but we also have next generation devices that will allow for dose metering, a real dose metering, not just a vibration. You mean not the, you can say them, not the dosist? <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, I'm sorry, Jeremy. Um, it's a beautiful product. It works great. It, it works great, and, it's, and, it, and it, it, it serves its purpose on the rec market, but it's not a, a dosing device. The problem is right now you need an airflow sensor to do proper dosing, and airflow sensors are not miniature. So the proper dosing devices are, are huge. They look like a, like a Bluetooth, uh, a, a, a Bluetooth um, whatchamacallit. Right. Shit, I'm losing my English. That's okay. You know, when you, when you look at medical – um, there's issues, uh, you know, for cannabis to be treated truly like a medical device in an inhalation format, there has to be, you know, compliance, adherence, uh, um, diversion avoidance, um, and, and, and data collection and tracking. Are you guys looking at those technologies to incorporate into your devices so that you could say go to, uh, you know, a Cardinal Health or somebody like that and say, we've got a device that if you use this oil, we can collect all of this data and make sure that somebody isn't just using this to get high, they're actually using this to treat, whether it be uh, neuropathy or other types of chronic pain? Well, we, we're looking at a lot of different technologies right now. Uh, we're fortunate to be working with, with uh, two uh, of our factories who are ISO 13485 certified, so that's medical device, and that's going to be of utmost importance for working with Canada as well. Um, because Health Canada asks for this if you want to be a class one, class two, class three, or class four medical device. Uh, so that is very, very important. And uh, furthermore, there has to be solutions. And uh, we, have, we have a prototype of this right now, uh, an NFC-based uh, solution where the device will automatically detect what pod you're putting inside and what's in there, of course, there has to be a database that, that matches everything, but the device will automatically uh, detect it and provide the right temperature settings and provide the right preheat settings and provide uh, a lot of different information. We can imagine a V2 of that device. Of course, that would be connected to your phone, but I, I don't really believe in that. I mean, if you look at the, the statistics for the PAX era, for instance, 7% of the people who buy it download the app and only 1% of those 7% actually use it. Um, I just think it's it's cumbersome because you want a vape that you pull out of your pocket, you take a puff and you put it back in. Uh, you don't want to be having, having to look at your phone all the time. Um, so I think uh, I think those kind of technologies uh, are, are going to be good for the medical side. To be honest, if you look at like a medical market like New York, some of the cartridges that are sold in the medical market in New York wouldn't even pass basic FCC regulations. Um, and, and they're being called medical. That's, that's what really uh, kills me. And, and that's how we try to educate all of our clients and say, yes, this for now it works, but once there's going to be uh, more oversight and people are going to start digging in, in, in between the weeds, they're going to see that these products uh, don't have a custody chain. These products are not sterilized. These products are not up to medical standards. So, so Arno, you, you, this is a little bit off topic, but you, you use the New York word, um, your downtown word, Midtown Manhattan. Give us your thoughts on what it's going to take to get legalization over the hump in Albany. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would, I, I wish I could pull that up, pull that off. In a, in a... And by the way, we are recording this on June 14th and the, the legislative session for the state ends next week. So either this gets done next week or it gets pushed off until next year. I, I think, I believe there's kind of a, of a, of a race between New Jersey and New York. Uh, New York, New York never spoke of it until, until, until Murphy got elected in Jersey. And, uh, and, and now that, that New Jersey has backed off a little bit, then what happens? Well, Cuomo comes out and says, we think we're not going to get it passed this time. It's not our priority anymore. Uh, 
so I, I still think we're, we're, we're ways from it. I don't believe it'll happen within the next week. Um, but, uh, it'll, it will probably happen very soon. Okay. We are just about at the end of our time with you. We want to be respectful. Um, we have one question that we tend to ask all of our, our guests, which is, you know, you wake up tomorrow morning, you open up the New York post or the New York times. What is the story that you wish were being told about the cannabis industry? What's the most underreported, undertold story that, you know, the media just isn't getting? You know, if you could talk to Craig Giamona at Bloomberg and grab him by his lapels, not that he wears a shirt that, where, where he has lapels, it's usually just a T-shirt, but you grab Craig and you say, Craig, write about this. What is this? Um, I think it's, it's I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to take this back to standards, uh, but writing and empowering, using media to empower consumers to understand what they're getting and understand that the products they're buying in legal retailers, uh, whether it's for medical or adult use, are probably a lot better than the products that people are buying on the black market. I would love to see a study of uh, 10 cartridges uh, or 10 different concentrates that, that are bought in the legal markets and 10 others that are bought in the street and have all of that exposed and the analysis because we've done it a, a few times, it's scary what you see in these devices. I think by doing that, it would serve the entire industry by bringing an inflow of more consumers who will understand that, yeah, they're gonna pay it a little bit more if they buy it on the legal market, but at least they're not gonna fuck up their, their internals. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Arno. No problem, thank you guys. Well, that was our conversation with Arnaud Durale, the co-founder and co-CEO of The Blink Group. And boy, what a fabulous, you know, you wouldn't think that talking about vape cartridges for 45 minutes would be so engaging, but Arnaud is awesome. I want to give a special thanks to my partner, Jeffrey Goldberger. He is no longer a virgin. We have gently de-virginized him uh, this week. Uh, as always, a special shout out to Nick Opich, who is the producer extraordinaire. Um, we miss Annie, my little jar of joy. It's her birthday today, so she didn't get to join me today. Um, as always, if you want to chat with us, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter with the handle on Twitter. Um, it's at the underscore Green Rush and on Instagram with the handle at the Green Rush underscore podcast, and we've got to figure out a way to get those two to be the same. It really doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you can send us email at the Green Rush at KCSA. I love my hate mail. Send me more hate mail. Um, and please don't forget to subscribe to the Green Rush in your favorite podcatcher. It's that little button up there on the right where it says subscribe. Um, and you know what? That's one take, Shay. One take.